People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do. But they stay because of all the things they can be. Can you feel this? Um, yeah. Hi folks, I'm Ignaty Wisniewski. And I'm Alex Dowd. Today, we're talking about the new film from Steven Spielberg, Ready Player One. Welcome to Film Club. I think American Graffiti kind of kicked it off, but that generation of filmmakers, Spielberg, George Lucas, later Robert Zemeckis, were really the first to sell adolescent and childhood nostalgia as a, as a form of entertainment in and of itself, right? I mean, you've got nostalgic entertainments earlier in Hollywood, usually pining for the kind of the end of the 19th century. Really, the 70s is when, when films that are trying to, to get their audience to feel nostalgic about their childhoods, about mm. their, their formative experiences, and the entertainment, the music that they liked back then, the movies that they liked back then, start to come out. I mean, Star Wars, that we think of it as its own thing, is a very nostalgic movie mm -hmm. for serials, for different kind of kinds of adventure movies. It's also true of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And yeah, I mean, they're, they're, the, they're the film brat generation is yeah. what, what they're called. You know, these guys who grew up watching movies, as most people do, but who sort of built their careers on the foundation of the stuff that they geeked out about when they were young. Yeah, or, or just the, the things they fondly remembered. I mean, you get something like Back to the Future is totally steeped in nostalgia for the 1950s. Yeah. And in many ways, these films have eclipsed their source material. Mm -hmm. um, they're now better known than the things they were riffing on. Mm -hmm. And now we get Ready Player One, uh, an adaptation of a novel by Ernest Cline that is steeped in a nostalgia for those films, for the film, filmmakers basically of Spielberg's own generation. Nostalgia for nostalgia, essentially, yeah. 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 And in a lot of respects, having Spielberg, sort of securing Spielberg to direct this thing was a very shrewd move on their part because his name is is a brand as strong as any of the, the, the many, many, many pop culture references that are packed into this thing. In fact, the absence of direct references to his work, though there are some, mm -hmm. is kind of like a structuring absence in this movie, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. Like, it's like they bring up everything except... Spielberg films. Right. Well, the, not entirely, but there are scenes in this movie where uh, every single frame is is packed with as much pop culture allusions and references as, as you can spot. I imagine this is a movie that's been designed to be freeze framed at a certain point. It's, it's definitely. Know? It's very much a note takers. Film. <laughs> very you know, much you can, so. A critic trying to play spot the reference would probably fill up an entire notepad over the over the course of the movie. Now, to explain, it takes place in the future in a fairly unhappy future where we're kind of the great global pastime is this virtual reality called the Oasis, mm -hmm. which was created by a character named James Halliday. He's played by Mark Rylance, who's dead by the time the movie starts, mm -hmm. and who left these clues supposedly leading to some keys that'll, un that'll lead to an Easter egg that'll give you control of his company and the Oasis a little bit of a Willy Wonka thing mm -hmm. um, inside the game. And so because everyone is trying to figure out how, uh, where these clues might be buried, uh, everyone playing the game is sort of steeped in the same pop culture that obsessed this, uh, this Halliday character who yeah. grew up in the 1980s. Yep. Uh, which is a good explanation for why kids in, two, in 2045 are obsessed with, you know, Buckaroo, a bonsai, and, and, and other uh, sort of uh, 80s touchstones, you know. The world itself becomes this kind of, uh, people don't just go there to game, they sort of live alternate lives in, the, in this digital world. And its own huge economy, yes. which is also kind of a part of the plot. For sure. So, I mean, one of the major criticisms of the book, the book has become very divisive in the six years or so since it, since it came out, um, is that it operates as just sort of a uh, reference delivery system. That uh, you're just sort of, you're sort of reading him reference things over and over and over again. Just sort of, how can we put this one thing you recognize against this other thing that you recognize? Well, that's also true of the film. I yes. think the difference is that the film has the benefit of Steven Spielberg's sense of style. Yes. Um, <laughs> He can put all of these things together and make a very entertaining set piece out of it. There's a, there's yeah. a very nice sort of Hot Wheels style chase through a, a fantastic Manhattan packed yeah. with movie characters and movie monsters. You get uh, T the T-Rex makes mm -hmm. an appearance in there from Jurassic Park, which so does King Kong. Right. I mean, I, and I think that that moment is Spielberg sort of drawing a straight line between 
uh, his own filmography and the stuff that obsesses him, which I think is a large part of, of his enthusiasm for this project, is he gets to kind of play around in this sandbox that he helped create, you know? I, I know it's a little bit of an auteurist reading, but mm -hmm. I feel like what's so much more interesting than all of the, you could say, non-Spielbergian references that are crammed in this film, I mean, you get Battletoads, you get Hello Kitty, you get Gundam, <laughs> Ba you get like five appearances from the Battletoads. Um, <laughs> maybe Spielberg had a brief period maybe he where just he just loves, was really into loves that. Battletoads. <laughs> yeah. uh, what's more interesting to me is the film as a as an elaborate homage to his peers, to uh, often referencing directors who he worked with, who he collaborated with, who were his friends, um, and also to his influences. Because though the you have these characters within the this digital world playing, yeah, they play characters from 80s movies, they take on these personas. You also get, for instance, monsters from Ray Harryhausen movies wandering right. around, sort of the stuff of his own childhood. Right. And I mean, I've got to say, going into this, I was a little concerned because I found his Spielberg's previous dabbling in motion capture uh, spectacle to be kind of um, kind of weightless. Uh, I, I, I didn't much care for his Tintin film. I'm not a big fan of the BFG either. I think that um, there's like no filmmaker working today uh, maybe ever who has been better at integrating digital sort of sort of digital characters and CGI into a physical world, but when that ratio gets reversed, I think he sometimes can kind of lose himself. This would be an exception, though. I think that he's this the, the action scenes in this I think are are extraordinary. A lot of them. Um, I mean, the chase scene we talked about I think is great in terms of uh, tracking the POV of the characters. I think there's a lot of a visual, visual imagination going on constantly. There's one great, great set piece in this film that I, we cannot, I would not dream of spoiling uh, that involves Spielberg playing direct tribute to, we'll say, a, a kindred spirit of some sort. <laughs> uh, but the plot is nothing to write home about. No, no, I agree. And in fact, I think there's a lot of satirical possibility in this premise that goes unrealized, that, that went unrealized in Klein's novel and goes unrealized with Spielberg taking over. I mean, th there's, there's a potential for a very cynical point about a whole generation kind of disappearing into their obsessions rather than looking, looking at the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's a dystopian premise to, mm -hmm. in some respects. But from right there in the opening scene where Spielberg is kind of giving us this tour of, uh, I believe they call it the stacks. It's basically a series of trailer homes uh, stacked, stacked vertically up in, in Columbus, Ohio, where a lot of people live. The camera is sort of weaving around the, this community and we're seeing like, like all of the occupants of it are basically lost in this digital world, have, have the visor over their face. That could be a moment that played for real despair and horror. I mean, the idea of people just completely detaching from reality, but Klein and Spielberg. And living in squalor. And living in squalor, yeah. Mm -hmm. But Klein and Spielberg are not the, the type who would, who, would, uh, who would have that kind of critical perspective on this. Um, for one thing, because I think that would be kind of biting the hand that feeds, you know? The movie does have this ostensible moral about how reality is the only thing that's real or something. They say something along those yeah. lines. But this idea that, that the real world does matter, you can't just escape from it. And I feel like the movie almost makes almost a self-defeating case for that point in the sense that the performance of Mark Rylance, which I think is really, really great, mm -hmm. as the creator of the game, as kind of this ghost in the machine, is so much more interesting as a live action piece of acting yeah. than a lot of what we see in this fantastical world. Right. I mean, I think this is a film that's built entirely from from contradictions. You know, I mean, it's you have characters fight. I mean, the villain played by Ben Mendelsohn is this sort of corporate slime ball from very recognizable, in fact, from plenty of 80s films yeah. um, who's out to monopolize and monetize the, the Oasis. Um, but I mean, I think uh, there's a certain irony in the fact that you, the, these kids are, are, are fighting a, a sort of evil corporate empire when their entire identities have been shaped by corporate product. You know, that's one of the many, I think, uh, ironies and contradictions in this premise. But I found something much bigger than just myself. Are you willing to fight? Help us save the Oasis. 